So good morning and welcome um, to our session on transformation in healthcare. Clearly a very important topic like many other topics which we are discussing here, but clearly health is the, the, base, the basic uh, foundation for any uh, standard of living here in, in Africa and around the world. Is it better now? Okay, sorry. Um, and I'm very happy to, uh, to have a very good panel with us uh, this morning. Uh, let me briefly introduce uh, our panelist, Henry Bastaros, uh, the founder and chief executive uh, officer of Peak Vision Foundation. We have uh, Jürgen Brokatsky geiger the uh, global head of corporate responsibility of Novartis. We have Laura Lane, the president for public affairs uh, of UPS, and uh, Dalgit Singh, the um, uh, president of Fortis Healthcare in India. And we expect still uh, President Conde from Guinea. I'm sure he will join us um, as we get started. So uh, let me just uh, briefly give you an idea about the context. And uh, clearly healthcare is one of the basics that we have to get right in order to ensure development, not just in Africa, but everywhere in the world. Uh, there are enormous challenges that we are uh, having in Africa. Uh, just to give you some, some idea, I mean, we have uh, only 15% of the world's population at the moment in Africa, but we have 25% of all the major uh, disease burden in Africa and only 2% of the doctors. Now, and as you can imagine, with uh, Africa's population doubling by 2050, uh, that burden, the health burden, will be significantly increased. Yet, of course, there's also a lot of uh, optimism about uh, the changes, um, the innovations, the creativity that we see here in Africa, and also many companies from around the world who are trying to address the healthcare issues with, with new solutions. Uh, but we should, of course, bear in mind that um, it's not just you know, bringing solutions from the West and the East um, when we know that about a quarter of the hospitals in Africa have no electricity. Um, you know, just having smartphones is not the solution. Um, and, and so I think we need to find ways of dealing both with the challenges and, um, you know, trying to find new solutions. With all the talk about technology, and I'm sure we'll address uh, the new solutions, we should not find uh, or not forget that there are many basic things that we have to uh, uh, tackle. And so I think um, while we will not be able within the next hour to address all those issues, I think the, we should never forget that besides all the technology and the solutions and the new creativity, there is a fundamental <coughs> issue of basic health to be solved. Um, but that will be for another panel. So we would like to talk today about two basic things, you know, new technologies, how uh, they can really help uh, address the healthcare issues in Africa, and then one important ingredient in the new technologies, and that is data. But first, let's talk about um, the um, you know, new technologies, new ideas, creative solutions, and we have, uh, I think, quite a lot of interesting uh, ideas to, uh, from this panel. Let me start um, with, um, with uh, Jürgen, and um, you know, uh, you know, Novartis, of course, has uh, addressed a lot of issues in the past, Jürgen, um, and uh, is now also, uh, you know, focusing a lot on non-communicable diseases in Africa. Uh, what are the innovations that pharma companies can bring to Africa, and how can you really provide access um, to uh, low-income uh, countries, low-income uh, households, uh, and provide uh, access really for the key uh, drugs that uh, you and others are developing? Thank you for the question. So actually, when I started in my new role about two years ago, we, we also had uh, uh, a few months before a new chairman in the company. And in my first meeting with the chairman, he asked me, so what else could we do in, for example, sub-Saharan Africa, which we never tried? Because we have a big malaria initiative, it's our biggest product, and we also do social businesses in, in other parts of the world, including in Kenya. 
And the second request was, can you bring it closer to the business to make it sustainable so that business has an interest in what we do and it's not just philanthropy um, or donations. And then what we did is we went uh, to uh, ministers of health in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa and other countries and asked them, what do you need? Yeah, what do you think a pharmaceutical company like Novartis can contribute? And the answer was, in a way, a little bit surprising. It, it was not that the ministers would tell us we need more help on HIV, on, on, on communicable diseases. The biggest problem uh, we have coming up is non-communicable diseases, high blood pressure, diabetes, and so on. So we went back and uh, had a discussion internally and, and uh, tried to uh, put on, on, on the table a, a program which we could deliver. So what is our strength to, to use our strengths? One strength is we can produce high quality drugs to a very low price because we have a, one of the biggest generic companies as a part of Novartis. We also have operational capabilities to make it happen and bring the drugs closer to the, to the government. Then we said, so whose responsibility actually is it to change the picture? And we thought it's clearly the government, but we can contribute to this. And as a result of this, we came up and, and now uh, introduced in Kenya uh, and in Ethiopia uh, a range of products. It's a portfolio of product uh, which are able to treat hypertension, diabetes, uh, respiratory diseases, but also breast cancer. And we sell these drugs for $1 a monthly treatment. So that's an extremely uh, low price for a high quality drug. And the idea is that we would sell it uh, to government or we sell it to Red Cross or to faith-based organizations and they would use it in their public clinics. So it would really get to the patients who have no money, sometimes no insurance, and uh, to, to, to make this available for them. And the idea behind this is a partnership. So partnership with government, we contribute something, but also NGOs, um, other organizations could contribute to this by helping in awareness building, you know, because many people, as we know, in many parts of the world are not aware of what causes high blood pressure, what causes diabetes, and how can it be prevented by early interventions. So that's an operational innovation which we started and which we are now rolling out in different countries. And the last thing I would like to mention is I have been in podium discussions several times before um, since I'm in my new role. And interestingly, always at the same time, somebody talked about non-affordable drugs. And then the whole discussion was around affordability. And people did not talk about, about the supply chain, about the lack of doctors, the lack of healthcare workers, mm -hmm. all these other things which need to work together. Yes. And, um, and now, when I'm in other panels and we say, okay, look, this is the drug, this is the portfolio we have, the discussion goes in a very different direction. No, I think that's very good. I mean, as I also said at the beginning, I think we, we, despite all the talk about new technologies, new approaches, new methodologies, we should never forget the basics. You know, as you mentioned, you know, how do we make sure that the supply chain works, the doctors are in place and so forth. So I think we need, always need to balance this. Now, Andrew, you have taken, of course, a very different approach, really bringing new technology uh, to the healthcare uh, sector and uh, really trying to work out and make sure that you know, the new technologies really also work in a, in a very uh, challenging environment. Maybe you can talk us a bit, uh, tell us a bit more about uh, you know, your uh, approach and, and your products and services. Thank you, and good morning. And sorry to those of you who have to see the back of my head. I hope it looks OK. <laughs> um, so my, my background is as an eye surgeon and a PhD in uh, public health and epidemiology. And in 2011, I moved to Kenya to establish 100 temporary eye clinics taking state-of-the-art equipment costing over $150,000 and trained a team of 20 people to operate the equipment. What I was finding in the field was that in the places with least infrastructure, so no roads, no electricity, no water, would be the greatest queues of patients. And the, the travesty for me is that the majority of people I was seeing were unnecessarily blind. So 80% of people who are blind don't need to be, so we've already got the cure. Um, so as we come up with these new drugs, treatments, the next question is, well, so what? If you have the cure and you don't deliver it, we've done nothing. And that's where we are with eye care at the moment. We have a solution, but it's not being delivered. Um, and so this was my, my kind of ambition at this point was how can we change this? And so started developing mobile technology, which would replace each of the pieces of equipment we had in the field. And we put them all through rigorous trials to validate them. And the key was testing them in the hands of non-healthcare workers. 
And, and the reason it was important to test them in the hands of non-healthcare workers is because, as has been said, there's a, a great limit in terms of the number of people av available to perform and deliver basic healthcare. Um, so extending the workforce by enabling non-healthcare workers, so as an example, we've now trained teachers to be able to use our equipment to screen children in schools rather than sending a health professional from an institution to the school. And this enabled us to screen 21,000 children by 25 teachers in just nine days. And we're now able to scale this up to 300,000 children in that same region. And the key has been not the technology, but the people who are operating it behind it. So if there is no people able to provide treatment, then we're actually causing harm by screening and not being able to put them into a service that can provide treatment. So our start point is always, what can you provide? What is your existing capacity? And what is the quality of the treatment that you provide already? And if there is potential to use greater capacity, we will then build programs and services using technology to, to enable uh, eye care. So in effect, you, you're making the same point that Jürgen made earlier. I think we need to talk about the basics, the supply chain, the people. Um, and given that you know, we are clearly having constraints on, on doctors, I think, as you said, really uh, training uh, teachers, for example, to apply uh, the diagnosis, I think, is really key. And it's not actually the fancy technology um, that, uh, that really makes the difference. Very interesting. Let me, uh, and I, I would, uh, you know, we have now uh, President Conde um, joining us. But I would like to follow up with, with Laura and, and Dalgit first, and then come back to you, Mr. President, um, to, uh, to talk about um, the challenges that you are facing in, in Guinea and, and some of the uh, approaches that you have taken. But Laura, you know, so we talked about the supply chain. Now, clearly, um, you know, UPS is working on the supply chain. That's the, the heart of, of what you're doing. Uh, tell us a bit about your new pro approaches um, and uh, how you uh, will facilitate better health care, even in the remote places. Right. I mean, logistics is essential, as everyone has said, in terms of transforming health care. And UPS has taken it as one of our four strategic imperatives, because we recognize if you've got the life-saving medicines, but they can't get to the patient, what good can they do then? And so UPS is really focused on ways to develop very high-tech, innovative transformation in terms of logistics and very low-tech examples. So I want to talk about a couple of them. First, um, and I'm really excited about it, uh, we have a tremendous partnership with Zipline, with Gave, um, which is an organization aimed at getting vaccines out to as many people around the world as possible, and the Rwandan government uh, to develop a new drone technology for being able to access clinics um, in far-flung parts of Rwanda that can't be easily reached in a timely way. And um, the partnership involves using uh, a variety of uh, drones to be able to reach 21 different transfusion facilities doing 150 deliveries a day of blood supplies. And, and, and you'd think, why is that so essential? The World Health Organization has said that one of the highest death rates for women comes from postpartum hemorrhaging, that the access to life-saving blood is essential. UPS wanted to be part of the solution, and that's why we've partnered with the Rwandan government and this Zipline uh, drone technology company to find ways to get that life-saving blood just in time to those transfusion facilities. And then it doesn't matter um, where they are um, in the farthest reaches of Rwanda, they can get that access to that blood. A second example is you've got a lot of new innovations with these vaccines and biologic medicines, but they need to be temperature controlled. And there's a lot of remote locations, as it just been said, that don't have electricity or don't have a means for um, keeping uh, medicines in temperature controls. So P UPS said, we've got to find a solution to that issue. And um, we've been working in partnership with uh, various companies and developed um, a container called the PharmaPort 360 that is used to uh, deliver um, medicines and vaccines that need to be temper con temperature controlled. They can come off of our cargo planes, off of our um, package cars, stay temperature controlled until they get to the final location, all solar powered, not needing you know, any kind of plug to plug in. And what uh, this translates into is you know, the ability for people in the farthest flung reaches um, of, uh, of the world to be able to get access to the, some of those most innovative of medicines. 
And then the third example is a little bit more low tech if you think about it. Um, a lot of uh, uh, parts of Africa, many people um, live in rural areas. They're not in the urban centers. They don't have access to the hospitals um, and, um, and it, it, it uh, shares some of the ideas that you've seen out in the field. So how do you bring life-saving um, procedures and medicines and um, information uh, to those far-flung places? You do it through logistics, right? And so what we've been doing is partnering with a lot of companies that have found ways to do procedures that can be done in home or in very remote locations, ship the samples, uh, through UPS or any other logistics company back to a processing facility to, to be able to determine what the diagnosis is, what kind of treatment is needed, and then responding with what, uh, whatever is needed. Again, bringing the logistics into play to bring those products um, or uh, you know next procedures to the patient wherever they are. So it's very much globalizing that access to medicine so that you don't have to be in an urban center because logistics then becomes that connection point for the access to medicines, those procedures for diagnosis, and better quality health care. And UPS is proud to partner with a lot of the pharmaceutical companies, the medical device companies, the screening companies, being that logistic solution so that more people have the opportunity to get access to um, the new innovations that are changing health care. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. So, Dalja, talking about operating models, I mean, you are one of the, uh, the big private operators in India. And we see that uh, also on this continent, uh, private health uh, providers are already taking 50% of the, of the overall market. Um, and uh, the key then is um, how can we make sure that despite the lack of infrastructure uh, in Africa and other uh, countries uh, like India, can, how can we make sure that there are new operating models that really are um, cost uh, efficient, uh, that uh, provide better access for uh, patients um, in, uh, in places where actually living standards are still very low and income levels are still very low. Yeah. <clears throat> so in India, uh, in many ways, uh, there's a lot of similarity, similarity to Africa. So roughly about 65% of our population lives in the rural areas and has pretty poor access to healthcare. Uh, some of us who are fortunate to live in the largest cities like Mumbai, Delhi, etc., we have access to some of the finest healthcare, uh, you know, um, uh, technologies and treatments available anywhere in the world. Uh, the compelling part in our country is that today about 75% of people need to pay out of pocket for healthcare. They are not necessarily insured. Uh, it's a it's a huge challenge, and because of that. There is, a, there is an obsessive and a compulsive need for all healthcare providers to ensure that costs are kept very low. And just to give you a, a quick statistic, uh, if I look at my career in healthcare for the last 14 years, we found that our doctor salaries have gone up by about 500% in, in 14 years. Our nursing salaries have gone up by 400%. Uh, whereas a pricing has gone up probably by about 80% or 100% over this time frame, which really says that we've been able to uh, create very efficient systems within our hospitals, be it through the use of technology, be it through the use of better processes and systems, and thirdly, through better training and capability or, or, or you know, um, uh, tasking in a different manner within the hospital systems whilst maintaining quality at a very, very high level. And that's really a very, very compelling need for us. Uh, so in hospitals like, like ours, which are amongst the, the best, I would say, in the world, uh, we are able to provide a cardiac surgery for as low as about 4,000 US dollars compared to perhaps 100,000 US dollars in the US and of standards that are internationally acceptable. And that comes through a, a huge amount of focus um, on our day-to-day -day operations and what is it that we can do better, faster, cheaper, without in any way compromising quality. In fact, the quality parameter necessarily has to go up. Now, when, it, when you come to the, the, the challenges that are faced in a country, uh, and that's pretty much the same as in Africa, there are, we classify them under accessibility, affordability, and reliability. Reliability really means quality of services. So um, organizations like us, so we, we have probably taken a lead in, in this domain where we've tried to um, reach patients 
in distant places through the use of technology. So I'll just give you one example. Uh, and this is, a, this is something that we started about three and a half, four years ago in partnership with General Electric, GE Healthcare, as also with Philips. And today, sitting at, um, uh, out of a small control center in one of our hospitals, uh, a group of intensivists are able to manage almost 500 ICU patients spread across almost a dozen locations very far away from Delhi. Now, this is a fantastic way of providing access to people who would Ha who wouldn't have the ability to travel all the way to a place, place like Delhi for healthcare. And to do it uh, locally uh, with, with uh, you know, very low-end and very basic doctors who have been trained to interact with the intensivists in order to you know, uh, uh, you know, carry out um, uh, medical treatments. And that's something very, very powerful in our domain. The second thing, from an access point of view, uh, we have some collaborations now in Africa. So we are setting up a hospital in, in Congo, which will be operational in the next few months. One of the things that we do is we recognize that healthcare must necessarily be local in character. It cannot be serviced from India you know, to help. So in this partnership, uh, we are going to be taking uh, the local doctors from here, providing them internships within our hospitals so that they observe you know, how to run ultrasounds, how to do dialysis, how to run cath labs, how to do minimal access surgery. And over a period of few years, that capability is transferred and ingrown you know, locally so that over a period of time, there is a, there's a nucleus of capability that is built in countries like Congo, Nigeria, and many other countries that we are actually foreign into. And, and the healthcare is actually spread out. So providing access can be done through multiple ways. Of course, we are also using technology in a big way. So we have connections to, I think, 56 centers through telemedicine uh, you know, within, within Africa, as, as well as over about two dozen centers in India. So technology is a very major enabler. But like my friend mentioned, uh, you cannot uh, you know, bring everybody up to a very high technology standard when, when at the ground level, things are very, very basic. So we have to work. Uh, at the local level from in terms of building appropriate infrastructure capability and moving them forward at a pace that is acceptable to everybody. I don't think we can bring in the highest levels of quality and standards in, in a domain where the basic standards are still not in place. So we have, to, we have to define quality and standards that are relevant locally. I sincerely believe that. And having defined that, let's try and do that, because that's where the maximum impact of excess can be felt. Good. Thanks very much. And now uh, let, uh, let me turn to uh, President Conde. Uh, welcome. Um, clearly, uh, Guinea has faced uh, major challenges over the last several years. And uh, now, of course, it's about to rebuild its healthcare system. Um, and I would like to know from you, I mean, you know, what are the key um, interventions that you're taking in order to ensure not just to strengthen the healthcare system, but also to uh, better protect, um, um, you know, this, uh, the system and the country and the society going forward, but also maybe changing behaviors of people. So what are the, the key approaches that you're taking in Guinea? Thank you very much. You know, Ebola uh, showed uh, the, the deficiencies of our uh, health systems. Ebola was not a, a disease we were familiar with. So Ebola had uh, characteristics that were completely opposed to our culture. For example, in Guinea, we greet people a lot, we hug people a lot, and when there's a death, um, you come and you uh, kiss the corpse on, on the forehead, and uh, you know that Ebola is trans transmitted through blood, etc. So we have been faced with a huge challenge because our uh, healthcare system was deficient, but also the, popula the population was not willing to uh, to participate. So we had to raise awareness extensively. We had resource people, we had religious leaders, customer leaders, so that the population would accept, cooperate. Because when you look at the doctors, they look like astronauts. You know, if, he, if he, 
someone from the village, they have never seen an helicopter, and you, you have this doctor coming up dressed up as a cosmonaut. It was complicated, so we had to make sure the population accepted to be, uh, to be cured. Uh, but so that we had to associate the religious leaders to have the resource people. And then the second issue we were faced with is that there was a lack of trust uh, towards the administration from the population. I had to go around 120 sous-prefectures, so local administration, to raise awareness to make sure the population were accepting things. And then there was another challenge. It was a lack of staff, a lack of personnel. And in that case, we decided to involve the local staff. The doctors were coming in, but the, the people from Guinea were actually doing the treatment. So we trained the doctors, we trained the local doctors, uh, capable people, not the best doctors, but capable people, uh, to be able to treat these people. So that was uh, our big challenge. Then we had to strengthen our health system. We used, of course, new technologies for that. We used uh, mobile phones. That was extremely important to identify and do a follow-up, the monitoring for uh, pregnant women, amongst others. Then internet for data management for the, uh, the response to the disease throughout the various campaigns. the va vaccination campaigns in that case, because we had Ebola, but there was also measles, meningitis, polio. So we, we had to have this data in hand. So we also worked a lot on our communication for vaccination. Today, we use uh, telemedicine uh, and uh, medical imaging. We have uh, a lot of IT in, uh, in the healthcare systems. We have also uh, developed what we called uh, community health workers because, or health doctors because the biggest problem is to have access to a population in remote areas, as our friends from India were saying. People, the population are very uh, far away from the health center. So we realized that it was better uh, to have uh, local improved health, health centers. Uh, so that we didn't have to move the populations away from their home. Because when you move people, uh, people think that if they go away, they're going to die. They're not going to come back. So it's better to have them cured on site. So that's how we started building local community health centers. Because when uh, the, the person that is sick is being treated next to his family, it's, uh, it's better for, for, for them. So. It, Ebola led us to review a whole healthcare system, but the basis was really how to lead the population to accept the doctors. And uh, so we really tried to overcome this lack of trust. And a great challenge today is to make sure that population has access quickly to healthcare. Uh, and gradually, we were getting to this point. Of course, new technologies facilitated all this because it allows us to very quickly uh, detect uh, the, the people who are sick to screen them and transmit the information to healthcare centers. Sorry, our friend from uh, India is doing something in in Congo uh, that we are currently doing in Guinea because we really want to use the new technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, let us now uh, uh, focus and, and build on what we heard earlier about the supply chains, new approaches, new delivery mechanisms, and a key ingredient of that, of course, is uh, uh, better data, um, more data on who, what, where, and how. And um, and so I think you know that you know in in different ways you all are, uh, I think, uh, dealing with a lot more information. Uh, and how are you making good use of that? without, of course, um, uh, adding to issues of privacy uh, and, um, and, of course, also security. And I would like to start with, with Laura asking you about, you know, how, I mean, obviously data is key for, for the supply chains and, and for, for um, uh, logistics, you know, what are you using um, in terms of additional data, how you make better use of what you have in order to, uh, to refine your processes? 
So let me give you a really good example of um, a partnership we have going on right now with the World Food Program and the Pandemic Preparedness Initiative. It's an example of how we're using data about um, challenges that countries face with respect to combating diseases uh, that um, have the potential to become pandemic crises. Um, uh, our partnership with a lot of private sector entities as well as NGOs who have a lot of uh, essential supplies as well as medicines as well as donations. We have a lot of information about what's available. Um, and then third is the aspect of where it's needed. And what we're using data for right now is combining that all together to create smarter logistics networks that are aimed at um, using data to understand what's needed where and making sure that we're creating warehousing and storage facilities um, in strategic locations so that when supplies, essential supplies, or access to particular medicines are needed, we know that the um, materials are stored and available, and we know what the smartest and most efficient routing is to get them to the location. So those are examples of where the data about the needs, about the, um, the response requirements, and about the best logistics routing all come together to provide just-in-time life-saving access to medicines that make a difference at the time um, when they're needed. Uh, and so data infuses everything we do. It, it, it tells us what we, uh, what we need to be um, working with our partners on in terms of storage and warehousing. It tells us what we need in terms of how to get things uh, through the mm -hmm. smartest logistics mechanisms, whether through the air, through the road, or through drones, um, and um, tells us that um, uh, the information that we're being supplied about the needs on the ground. So for example, in the Ebola crisis, we worked very closely with a number of governments um, to identify some of the essential supplies they needed and figured out ways to draw them from the stockpiles that existed around the world and bring them as quickly as possible to the places that needed them using the smartest logistics, the most time-sensitive uh, uh, routings, um, mm -hmm. and the most cost-effective routings. Because at the end of the day, you want to bring it fast, but you want to bring it cost-effectively because you want all the money going back into life-saving results, not into paying for more um, logistics. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, Laura, you mentioned the word partner, so it's not just your own data, but it's data from, from uh, UPS, of course, but also from uh, many other partners with whom you work together, because I guess you don't have the full uh, spectrum of, of the data needed. No, and that's exactly the point. Um, Public-private partnerships need to be the solutions going forward mm -hmm. because the challenges today require a lot of different actors, traditional healthcare actors as well as non-traditional actors like just logistics companies coming together in partnership, sharing information, sharing needs, mm -hmm. sharing know-how, sharing technology, and bringing it all together for those smart solutions. And so we rely all the time on partnerships. The only reason and we're able to do what we are able to do right now in Rwanda is because of a great partnership with the Rwandan government, a great partnership with a technology company and an organization like Gavi that knows more than UPS ever will about how to get the right vaccines to the right populations. But together, we can uh, you know, transform the way healthcare is delivered. Great. Thanks very much. Andrew, your approach, of course, generates enormous amounts of data. Can you really digest those and can you use them and how you do it? Yeah, it's a very good question. So there's, you know, there's been a lot of talk recently of big data. Um, my biggest concern is bad data. Um, you know, we end up drowning in, in data, even just my own small project that I initiated, I, I, three years later, haven't finished analyzing it all. Um, so the question for me is what data drives action? Because we can have as much information as we want, but if it doesn't result in either patients receiving treatment or the access to eye care or healthcare in general being improved, we're not really doing anything other than having more academic data. Um, so to give you an example in terms of how our programs work, in our school screening program, for example, we, where the teachers are screening the children, we're able on our dashboards to monitor how many children have been screened, how many have been referred. Of those referred, how many have attended the treatment center, um, which ones didn't attend the treatment center, we're able to share information with different key players in the system. So head teachers receive lists of children in their school who need to go and attend for treatment. We use behavioral change text messaging to try and encourage behavior. And, and uh, you know, one time, one of the head teachers was so motivated, they organized a bus, took all of the children in the school to the hospital. 
And so we thought, how can we encourage that kind of behavior using the data that we're seeing? And we realized the key was comparative data. So letting one school or one primary healthcare facility know how they're doing compared to neighboring facilities, because that's what drives change. And it's true on a national level. If your country is the third worst or the second best, that's the kind of thing that makes you want to step up and improve what you're doing. So it's using the information in a way that will, will drive change in a positive way. And also collecting just enough data to drive the decision. So when we're collecting retinal data, so we have people out in the field using our adapter on a phone, taking images of the back of the eye, can, do, do we need a, a very extensive detailed analysis of that image? Or do we just need to know enough that actions refer or not? Because that's all that really matters at that point to the patient is, do they need to leave their home and go to a facility, or do they stay at home? Um, so we're trying to titrate the data to always be actionable, um, and also always relevant. Um, so to give you a, a final example, in one of our um, centers in Tanzania, where diabetic assessments have been done in a peripheral clinic, we can review the amount of data that's being shared um, on our dashboard, and we could see one of the facilities for a week had no activity. Um, so the assumption was, are they doing no work? Is, is nothing happening? Has the phones been stolen? But it allowed us to just make a quick phone call and say, you know, why, why is no activity um, going on? And, and the simple answer is we've run out of money for data. Um, so it meant we could very quickly and pester some, some funds over and data could be transferred again. It's actually these very simple things that are blocking the provision of healthcare. Um, and if we don't know the blockers, we can't address them. Yeah. So it's, the key is providing appropriate data to enable the whole process. But obviously you probably can, could need a lot more crunching power to make better use of the data. So again, also partner support would be, uh, would be important for you to, uh, to make even better use of the data. Completely, and it's, it, it's the same as when we start a program and we assess the healthcare capacity, we also have to um, assess the data analysis capacity. So if, you know, if we're going to start bringing patients in and no one can treat them, then we're not doing a good service. If we're going to be bringing in lots of data and no one can analyze it, we're not providing a good service. So those things have to be addressed before you start the program. You don't just roll it out and then let's see what happens. Okay, very good. Jürgen, I mean, as you uh, really uh, try to approach uh, or to re realize multiple programs across Africa, you know, how do you use data in order to prioritize the different programs? Clearly, the demand is uh, almost unlimited, uh, but you want to have the biggest impact. And so how do you make sure that um, you know, you, uh, you're really focusing your efforts on uh, uh, the most urgent uh, issue and, of course, also reaching uh, more people than uh, with other approaches? Mm -hmm. Thanks. So l let me start to make one statement before I come to the question. What, what has been said several times here is that partnerships are the solution for the future. I just want to mention this as well, because it's not government, it's not pharmaceutical industry, it's not the civil sector who can solve the problem on its own. Um, and whenever I'm somewhere at the Gates Roundtable or at the UN Global Compact meetings, this is what I hear. On the other side, sometimes it's not practiced. Eh? And it's not practiced sometimes because of mistrust, because of people have perceptions about companies, about governments, about others. And I think there is a way or there should be a way to overcome these perceptions uh, for the future. And it's possible in a good way. Now to the data. There is unlimited need of data, yes. Um, and maybe I give you my example. So I, I'm a scientist by training and I was leading technical research and development for Novartis. So there's lots of data, lots of measurement, and the measurement made sense, yeah, because it's black and white very often. When I came into my corporate responsibility role, I was also confronted internally, but also externally, with how do you measure the success of what you do? And then sometimes I had the impression this is measurement to do measurement, yeah, to, just to, to measure something and publish something. But the question was, does these measurements, do they really make sense? And that's the approach which I now like in, 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 in Novartis because we bring these many of the corporate responsibilities close to the business. The business has a certain acumen and attitude to ask the right questions to grow the business. So they, they ask for data which help actually to kind of get to more patients uh, in different countries in, the, in, in, one and, in, in one and the same country, for example. Example, our malaria initiative, so Coartem is, is this uh, product which we have, it's our biggest one, as I said, and in this part of the world, often Coartem is more known than Novartis, which is good for, for uh, Coartem. Mm -hmm. But 
There we, we, we talk to local people and, and try to find out, so what is actually the reason why a patient would not get access to, to the drug? And it was because the, 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 the warehouses were not stocked or the hospitals had no stock and the patients would walk for a long time, but only to find out there is no, no drug available when they came to the hospital or to the healthcare center. So that was the, 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 uh, the starting point of what now has been developed over the last four or five years, which is now uh, a system which we work together with um, IT companies, together with local organizations, and through an iPad, through a smartphone, track the, the stock levels in these hospitals, and this message goes to a center, and then at the right time, stock can be uh, sent to these uh, uh, healthcare centers. But it's not only Coartem, yeah? it's now used for other drugs as well. It's very open, it's used for training and learning uh, material. So that's an example where actually a technology helped to in a way grow the business, although we sell Coartem for no profit. And then we, I talked about Novartis Access and this portfolio of, of these 15 drugs. There we also ask ourselves, so how can we measure if we have an impact and then in healthcare, it's very difficult to kind of um, find out what actually caused the the reason where people, you know, are more healthy than before. The drug is one factor, but it's early diagnosis. It's many other factors. So we work now together with, uh, we talk to Boston University and local organizations, and we say, can you help us to find out what is relevant for our, pro for our uh, project, for our initiative? And th there, the important piece is, does the drug get uh, not only to the airport, to the warehouse, does it get to the hospital, does it get in the end to the patient? So this is what we measure there to find out uh, what to do if something goes wrong. And the last thing I would like to mention is to the, to the uh, let's say, to foundations and NGOs. I think there's a lot of things which, is, which are done in this world to help people in awareness building and so on which you cannot really measure in a way, but NGOs, foundations, churches, they do a lot actually to, to, uh, to support healthcare in, in, in these uh, places. And my last sentence is back to what I said in the beginning. We see now great uh, cooperation and interest of uh, ministries of health in the countries we, we, we are already, like Ethiopia, Kenya, but also in others, where we started discussions, where we have a lack of, not a lack of interest, but, but where interest could be better is with NGOs, is with uh, foundations, who would help us in this Novartis Access program to do awareness building, what causes high blood pressure, what causes diabetes, and so on. So that partnership, I'm really interested to find more organizations who would partner okay. with us for this. Very good. Again, it's about partnership and, and getting basics right, and using the big data for the basics. So is the uh, drug really getting to uh, uh, the patient, uh, rather than just uh, finding out we have produced so much, but we are not sure whether it's being really consumed in the right way. Daljit, um, the buzzword uh, for many uh, providers, of course, is the, uh, the standardized electronic uh, patient record. Um, and. Um, you know, of course, that uh, entails uh, massive amounts of data. And of course, there are also a lot of uh, anxieties about what, you know, people are doing with these, these records and you know, getting, are these uh, records getting into the wrong hands? So um, is this key for you? Uh, are you applying it at Fortis? Um, and, um, you know, how, how can that be, you know, really run across uh, the whole healthcare system? Um. We've been talking about the electronic uh, medical record for, uh, for many years, actually. We also spoke about a paperless hospital way back when we started our hospital chain, which is about 15 years ago. Uh, but we are, I think the journey has just about begun. Uh, it's a long way off, and there, there are several reasons, I think, for this. One is that uh, the cost of IT, information technology, is extremely expensive. And given the... the, the Even in India. In India, <laughs> even in India, it's, it's very expensive. Uh, from an Indian point of view, because if we need to deliver care at the price points that I mentioned to you, uh, which are about perhaps 1 15th, 1 20th of many of the Western countries, then necessarily every penny that we spend has to be scrutinized for impact and effectiveness. And whilst it was, a, it was something that was nice to do, it was not the most compelling activity that we needed to. However, having made this journey of about 14 years now, 15 years in, our, in, in delivery of healthcare, we find that we have a large 
group of hospitals. We have over 50 hospitals. And patient portability or record portability across hospitals is, is, is being now felt as a need. And we have embarked upon a project. Uh, we expect that over the next 18 months, we would be in a position where we would have patient records for our Fortis group of hospitals. So any patient coming in, his data would be portable within the group of hospitals. Now, so as long as you go to a Fortis hospital, you will have one common ID, you will have co one common set of records, and that's great. But, but when you look at the entire ecosystem of healthcare in India, I think we have, we have huge challenges. We are nowhere as a country ready for it. Perhaps you, know, you could look at maybe half a dozen hospitals or hospital groups in the country would be looking at EMRs, EMRs as a means of driving whatever. Number two, I think in our, in our country, uh, whilst it's, it's talked a lot about in the West, data privacy is important, but it's, it's not one of those crying needs. You know, people don't really bang their heads against the wall uh, on, on data privacy issues, at least not yet. But the fact is that it is something that will, that will come in. And, and therefore, it's important for us to uh, look at it at the country level. We are talking to the government of India. The government of India has a program called Digital India. And I think the World Economic Forum is also partnering with them. But one of the, one of the aspects that we are looking at as a healthcare federation and NASCOM, which is the IT Association of India, uh, IT and the government, is that can we have a common platform that allows uh, 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 EMRs to be actually placed on them rather than every hospital chain doing its own thing because it's very uh, cost ineffective, it's too expensive, and, and it's not going to create the impact that we're looking at. And just our own hospital system is too small an ecosystem for it to have impact. So to my mind, that's going to be a, a big one. And one of the things that we are reading about nowadays is this entire blockchain technology. And, and I am aware that Philips has actually moved into, uh, um, has announced plans to invest in developing EMR. So they've got their IT experts, healthcare experts, and blockchain experts coming together to create a platform uh, which can actually do this. And what does it actually do? It provides a centralized platform, but data is managed decentrally, you know, in a decentralized manner with a huge amount of security measures. It's almost, they say, impossible to hack it or to corrupt it. And I think that's a, that's a great mm -hmm. way forward. And for a country like India, or even for the rest of the world, we need to collaborate and figure out solutions that make economic sense, not because they're just nice to do. I think nice to do can still wait, and uh, especially in countries like India and perhaps Africa, where the basics still need to be put into place. So, so from our point of view, what are really our priorities? We have three oh. overriding priorities when it comes to you know, information technology, use of information technology in hospitals. One is to deliver better, better patient care. So feedback from patients as to how, do, how has their whole experience been, and therefore keep sorting out issues in a sustainable manner so that our patients are happy. The appointment systems are getting to be online now. We're experimenting with that. It's still not online, by the way. And many of these things which are considered basic. The second is about driving clinical excellence. So we are probably the only hospital group today that has uh, announced about three months back that is going into the public domain with clinical outcomes. Clinical outcomes for angioplasties, clinical outcomes of cardiac surgeries, clinical outcomes for knee replacements. No other company is doing this, and this is audited by experts from your part of the world, you know, people who are acknowledged and who are actually you know, making this happen. The third domain, which is the overriding emphasis for us today in terms of data and information is in managing our hospitals efficiently. So when we, we look at patient processes, all patient-facing processes, we've categorized them. Almost about 250 to 300 processes are there in any hospital that are critical. Mm. And we have examined each one of them, and we are trying to make each one of them efficient. And what does it do for us? It reduces the length of stay of patients. So we were, uh, in one of our hospitals, able to drop our length of stay by as much as 25% just by work that we did over a period of four months. We were able to uh, uh, provide uh, reports on ultrasound, CT scans, MRIs within defined periods of 30 minutes or 60 minutes, something which was 
unheard of. We were able to do health checkups for patients in a matter of four and a half hours, and they don't need to come back again unless there's a complication. Okay. Uh, uh, so that's, another, that's a very major area of emphasis for us, because I mentioned to you that there's an obsessive need for us to keep costs yeah. low. And finally, is this entire domain of supply chain, you know, uh, uh, making sure that costs of surgeries are kept low, costs of procurement of goods is kept low. And we have targets that almost for the last five years, every year in real terms, we have dropped our cost of purchase by about 8% year on year. Okay. Now that's a huge amount of efficiency that you're actually bringing to the system. And that's all driven by information technology and data. Thanks very much, Dr. Uh, and uh, uh, last but not least, uh, President Conde, again, on the use of big data, and everybody talks about mapping diseases, how they are spreading, how pandemics are spreading, and so forth. How realistic is it really to, uh, to use big data uh, when uh, we know it's so difficult to get by the data? In Guinea, we use uh, data to monitor epidemiologic and to monitor the work that is done uh, by uh, the different uh, health care centers. So we have also data uh, regarding uh, that we name contact, meaning the people who have had contact with uh, people who were, um, who were sick. Secondly, we also use the data regarding the suspicious cases. And third type of data, the data of those who are actually sick. What we realized is that the uh, the people who have been determined as cured can still have uh, some traces of uh, the disease within them. And uh, for instance, uh, recently we have found cases of people with Ebola who were supposed to be cured. And uh, what we observed is that uh, some men keep the virus in their sperm. And therefore, we uh, started uh, to uh, monitor and identify among those who had been sick and test them and screen them. Uh, so data is important, follow-up is important. Secondly, uh, we, also we also use data regarding availability of drugs uh, through a centralized service. And it, as it was said, it's important to centralize the data, but it should be decentralized at the local level too. So. It's also important to follow up uh, to determine the availability of the drugs, uh, especially in the case of uh, Ebola. Ebola keeps bringing up surprises. And uh, I believe uh, that uh, the uh, uh, medical world has not really uh, actually managed to tackle Ebola. And uh, nobody expected that uh, in, our, in the case uh, of Guinea, some male patients who were supposed to be cured still had traces of the virus one year after in their sperm. So there's still a lot to be done. So today, we are reviewing our protocols. We are uh, monitoring and screening all the previous patients uh, uh, who were supposed to be cured. So vaccination is also very important, but constant surveillance, constant monitor of the uh, patients. We had not uh, planned this because once the person was cured, the person was discharged and there was nothing done after that. But surveillance and monitoring at the epidemiological level is also very important. Thank you. Let me now, let me now turn to the audience and um, I think I'm, I'm sure there are uh, quite a lot of uh, questions, uh, and we have a few minutes uh, from, uh, from you. Do we have a mic? There it is. Good afternoon. Thank you for Just a, a short question, please. Yeah. A short question. <laughs> My name is Whitney Schneiderman. I'm with Covington and Berlin. And um, my question is to uh, um, a theme of this conference has been a rising middle class. And as a lot of coming through private, most of your 
conversation was about government and partnerships with there. What is your strategy for making healthcare available for those who have the money to uh, purchase it through, through clinics? Thank you. Maybe a sh short answer to this. This is our normal business, I would call it. Huh? What, what uh, the normal business, which we do in many countries, also in countries here in Sub-Saharan Africa, where our business leaders find out what is needed with private clinics, how can we bring also innovative products uh, to the market to a reasonable price. This is also discussions which happen in our company to a different price. Differentiated pricing is one of the keywords. Um, and I was talking more about the, the, the poorer population because that's part of my role. Very good. We have a question here and over there, and then we go there. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Michele Castagnaro. Um, I work for a company called SICPA. Uh, the question that I wanted to uh, ask the panel was whether uh, the data environment into which you are confronted on a daily basis helps uh, fighting counterfeit medicines, which are visibly 30% of the total inflow in any given African country. Thank you. Andrew, any experience with that counterfeit? Uh, out of my domain. OK. I, I was going to jump in yeah. on that because, yeah. um, I mean, that's vitally important to us. I mean, we're, we're believers in strong laws uh, and protections in place. So intellectual property right protection is critical for helping to combat counterfeiting. But as a distributor, as, a, as a, uh, uh, an entity involved in logistics, we um, try to partner with pharmaceutical companies to ensure that there's good track and trace of the packages as they're moving so that um, when we pick them up at the point of origin, and they are legitimate goods, we ensure the integrity of the supply chain so that counterfeits can't get into the supply chain until they reach the end patient or the end provider. And um, secure supply chains are one part of the solution. I think also using track and trace technologies, which we use to track our packages, are going to be a very important ingredient in terms of tracking and tracing the serial numbers at various levels, um, not just at the lot level, but at the smallest package detail level so that um, there can be checks put in place to say, is mm -hmm. this a legitimate product? Is this serial number mm -hmm. real? And our track and trace technology, we're trying to use in partnership with other companies to ensure that real life-saving medicines are being delivered and not the counterfeits. Thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Ola. I run an air ambulance in Nigeria and we cover the whole of Western Central Africa. And my question, I think what I've gotten from the panel is that healthcare in developing countries is going to look different and feel different from healthcare, how healthcare has evolved in the West. So I'd just like to take the panel's view. If we're going to look forward 10, 15 years, what would, what would healthcare look like? And how would it be different um, from our counterparts in developing country, um, in developed countries. Okay, Tajit. Okay, let me have a go at that because it's something that we think about very deeply. I think um, whilst many of the developing countries, or underdeveloped countries, are very low down in their state or development or maturity of the healthcare sector, I think the the upside is that we have an op opportunity to learn from the mistakes that mistakes or learnings of the developed nations. Uh, one thing is very clear that the way healthcare is structured today in the developed nations and also in some of the biggest cities of India and perhaps Africa as well, is that we are in the business of sick care. So my hospitals make money or are financially sustainable only when somebody falls sick and wants a cardiac surgery or PTCA. We are not necessarily incentivized by keeping populations healthy. But if I were President Conde, uh, my role, my focus would be to keep my countrymen healthy and align all systems to, make, to achieve that objective. Now, if our objective is to keep everybody healthy, then the system necessarily needs to be integrated. Today, we are working in small pieces of what I would call as the healthcare delivery supply chain. And each, therefore, is creating value for itself. It's not necessarily creating or aligned to the overall objective of keeping people healthy. So in a nutshell, I think what we will see, or we should see in the next 10, 15 years, is a shift towards population health, where everybody is incentivized, whether it's doctors or providers or insurance companies, technology companies, to keeping the end 
patient, uh, healthy, and a contributing member of society. Thanks very much. And a last question here on this side. You raised your hand very early. Merci beaucoup. Je... Thank you very much. Uh, I'll take the opportunity, this, the opportunity of the presence of President Conde to speak French. Um, about the data issue, we're faced with two difficulties today. First of all, legal status of data, confidentiality, and the second, who takes, uh, who absorbs the cost of the, the, the initiative of the data mobilizing for the health system. On these two issues, the, the legal system and the funding of the treatment, what kind of answer uh, can the panel bring? Thank you. Andrew? Um, so in, in response to your first point around data security, so in, in all of our programs, we ensure that we're um, abiding by local standards, and local standards vary um, across countries and even within countries uh, at a district level it can vary. So we, we have to understand the local context and ensure our design is compatible. Um, in terms of who pays, that's an extremely good and difficult question to answer. Um, so it depends on what level. Um, you know, within eye care, for every dollar that you invest, four dollars is returned within the first year to the economy. So it makes complete sense to invest in it. But if you're a VC investing that dollar, you're not going to get the money back. Um, so who pays really ultimately has to be at government level. But for a government to adopt a program, several things will have to happen in the, first, in the period before that. So we're currently um, moving towards a national program with Botswana, where they've agreed to, to build this into their national budget cycle. But prior to doing that, we're having to get external funding, so NGO funding, to do the proof of principle, the pilot phase, um, and you know, in a developed economy, that might be insurance providers. Um, and, and so the, there's a lot of different challenges around doing this, in, including should it be the patient that pays? And should it be the population that's being screened that pays or just the person that's sick that pays? Um, and, and to be honest, my, my response is I have more questions than I do answers. Um, but these are all the things that we're trying to test at the moment. There are lots of different engagement models and lots of different ways to get this right. Um, and I don't think there'll be a single answer. Okay. President Conde, you know, what uh, would you say from a governance point of view? Uh, for us, the emergency was the emergency. Uh, that means to have access to, to data. That was the most important. Now, we need to fight against cyber criminality. So we have voted laws for data protection and to fight against cyber criminality. But we were first in an emergency uh, situation, given the consequences of Ebola on our country. But now that we've moved on uh, to, to this stage, as the Minister of Health has said, we've started voting the laws against cyber criminality. Thank you. So let me conclude, and um, I think what, what we learned actually probably maybe to the surprise of some is we're not talking about, you know, very sophisticated technology, but we're talking about many basic things and getting basic supply chains right, uh, really ensuring partnerships um, so that uh, really I think the different elements of the value chain are being um, improved uh, and not just proved uh, for each by itself, but I think together uh, with getting better outcomes. Um, and then I think the uh, ultimately is making sure that you know we are really using uh, things to get the basics right before we maybe jump too much ahead. Talking about uh, jumping ahead, um, the uh, uh, World Economic Forum, together with uh, the Boston Consulting Group, has uh, done a, a research and a report on healthcare leapfrogging. Now again, it's not about bringing the most sophisticated technology from one day to another, but it's about really, um, as we discussed earlier, really uh, trying to improve approaches using uh, the scarcities and the constraints that we're having in order to really come up with new creative solutions, which are not necessarily technology, but better behavior, better delivery systems, as Andrew has mentioned, you know, using the teachers, using uh, other um, uh, persons rather than really trying to uh, develop, um, you know, a huge number of doctors, which will take uh, a lot of time. So I think uh, take a look at uh, that report, again, healthcare leapfrogging. Um, but um, I think one of the key elements really, as uh, I think we, we, uh, we learned today, is really working together to optimize the whole value chain, the whole supply chain, and make sure that the different uh, partners 
uh, really seeing this as a win-win rather than, you know, we uh, lose because somebody else wins. And I think that will be really bringing uh, enormous uh, results and enormous value for um, not just the patients, but also, as, as Aljit has said, you know, making sure that people stay healthy and therefore we have better health in Africa going forward. Thank you very much.